Welcome. Welcome to this session on who pays for pollution. I'm very glad to be here today. Uh, my name is Céline Charaya. I'm the executive director of IEEP, the Institute for European Environmental Policy, a sustainability think tank. And we have two distinguished speakers today to talk about a very hot issue indeed. Who's paying for pollution? So we have Lucas Chancel, who's the co-director of the World Inequality Lab and also an associate professor at Sciences Po Paris. He's written many, many books on social justice and the environment. And he is also one of the co-authors of the World Inequality Report. So welcome, Luca. We also Morning. have um, today uh, James Watson, uh, the chief economist of Business Europe in Brussels. Um, and before joining Business Europe, uh, James has had a distinguished career in many uh, different places, the European Commission, the UK government, and also the Norwegian government. So we're really excited to have both of you to talk about this. We want to make this session as interactive as possible. So please, uh, the audience, do use Slido to ask your questions and also uh, tweet as part of uh, the hashtag for Green Week. So when we talk about who pays for pollution, um, the context is the following. We have the European Green Deal, which uh, is another way to confirm the attachment of the European Union to the famous polluter pay principles. We are also in a context where inequality is rising. We have uh, commitments are coming from the SDGs, but also from the Green Deal in terms of leaving no one behind and having a just uh, transition. And within that context, there have been many calls for reforming, uh, uh, the, to, to, for reforming taxes in general and looking at sustainable fiscal reform in particular. And the latest has been really uh, in terms of the context of the semester, but also the recommendations from the Commission to the member states for their recovery and resilience plan. And the truth is that for the moment, our taxation mainly remains focused on labor. Uh, revenues from labor tax and social uh, uh, contributions account for almost 50% of total tax revenues in the EU. In contrast, environmental taxation represents, in average, amongst member states, only 6%. And when we look at environmental taxation itself, we see that 97% of all revenues are focused on energy and transport, which means that the rest, other pollutions uh, or taxation on resources is very limited so far. So more than 100 years actually after uh, Arthur Pigou introduced the concept of environmental externalities, we still have a very long way to go in making the polluter uh, pain, which creates injustice but also mispricing pollution is a major impediment towards changing behaviors of consumers and producers. So in this session today, we will explore different viewpoints about who is paying for pollution, who should pay for pollution, and what can be done concretely as part of the European Green Deal. Before turning to the panelists, let me first share some preliminary outcomes of a study uh, that has been commissioned by the European Parliament on environmental fiscal reform, and that's been conducted by IEP together with a consortium of research partners. So let me first show you a few uh, PowerPoint slides. So who pays for pollution? So the policy context we have, as I said, we have the challenge of really oper operationalizing the pollution, polluter pay principles. We have unmet targets on environmental taxes. Already in 2011, we had a goal that by 2020, we would increase environmental taxes to at least 10% of public uh, revenue. And as I already said, we are now at about 6%. And what's even more troubling is the share has gone down slightly since 2013. There are big differences between member states, but on the average, we're nowhere near what we set as an objective in 2011. And let's remember that at that time we knew much less uh, about uh, the planetary boundaries and the emergency that we're facing. So uh, arguably uh, we would probably think there's even more a, a need to even go further potentially that 
We also have a very busy political context in terms of taxation. The upcoming reforms of the Energy Taxation Directive, the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism are putting green taxation high on the agenda of the EU. There are many more debates, obviously, as I mentioned, on the resilience and recovery plans. Uh, lots of discussions on digital taxation, on corporate taxation, and very uh, in the last few days, there's been an agreement on country-by-country uh, -country reporting. So the tax files are really hot at the moment, and we can also see a technonic shift coming from the United States with the Biden administration calling for a minimum tax rate on uh, corporate tax. So I would think that the moment to discuss tax is really right now. So then when we look at where we're at, um, we see that uh, in, in, in terms of air pollution, uh, for instance, uh, polluters only pay half of the cost of air pollution. Uh, and you can see that depending on the sectors, uh, uh, it's even, uh, you know, it's very, very limited. Uh, and this contrasts with how much the households are paying for the cost of air pollution. So we can see really uh, quite a bit of injustice there between sectors, but also between the corporate sectors uh, um, and, uh, and the household. Next slide on water pollution. Uh, here we see that really very little cost is internalized, uh, which is also troubling because under the Green Deal, uh, there are many uh, different objectives and uh, water is a key concern, including the pollution of water and in the Zero uh, Pollution Action Plan and other elements in the Green Deal, we need to find a way to make sure that we protect this uh, uh, critical resource for our well-being. Another good news coming from the study uh, is that green taxes can be good for growth and jobs. So uh, we did some modeling uh, and looked at a portfolio uh, of 30 billion of green taxes or green taxes or uh, uh, market-based instruments to replace income tax. And what we saw is that the impact on uh, the GDP was positive. So was the impact on employment with uh, 140,000 jobs created. And this is quite coherent with the modeling that has been done in the context of uh, the carbon neutrality goal and the beyond 55% uh, package, which again show that if ETS re revenues were recycled, you could have a positive redistribution. But of course, there's a long-standing debate as to whether green taxes are or not uh, uh, um, progressive. And they're often criticized actually as being uh, regressive. Well, our, uh, uh, our modeling shows that this is not the case. And obviously we have also many examples in member states where member states have been able to introduce green taxes while actually having a positive impact on uh, uh, distribution. So it all boils down to careful design of the taxes and the market-based instruments. So uh, thank you for your uh, attention in terms of uh, listening to the, the preliminary outcomes of this study. It is expected to be uh, published in uh, July 2021. And you can see here the different members of the consortium that uh, participated uh, in, in, in the study. And we really hope that it will be a, a very uh, uh, useful contribution to debates ahead in terms of environmental fiscal reform. So now turning to our uh, uh, panel, let me start with uh, James uh, uh, Watson. So James, you saw the outcomes of the study. Uh, clearly, we see that uh, the pollution, the cost of pollution uh, is largely passed on to society, to individuals, to future generations, rather than uh, uh, big polluters. Uh, we also see m the naked trends uh, that are going to be without any, if we don't have any further action, eroding the tax base, whether it's uh, demographic change, globalization, digitalization. So keeping those mega trends in mind and the lack of internalization of pollution, what is your position? Do you think that green taxes can be a force for good? James, we can't hear you. 
Is that better? Yes. Can you okay. speak up a little bit or yeah, jack yeah. up okay. your cam? Okay. Right. Well, thanks a lot, Celine, and, um, and morning, everybody. Um, look, I certainly think that, that, that green taxes have the potential um, to, to, to be a force for good. Um, as you say, we're at a particularly uh, challenging time, I think, on, on in terms of the economy, but certainly in terms of public finances. Um, we've obviously had the suspension of the Stability and Growth Pact at the moment, but as the Commission said uh, yesterday, at some point we are going to we're going to need to, to get our fiscal house in order, and that's going to include raising taxes at some point. So I think it's, it's a timely discussion that we're having about how we, how we can, um, unfortunately, increase taxes. And I think you're quite right that there's some, some potential um, regarding environmental taxes. There's some potential upside because, um, and as, as, as pleased you mentioned the figures, in, in Europe in particular, not only do we have a high tax level, but we have a particularly high tax level on labour, um, and we're talking about introducing new taxes on capital as well. Um, so, uh, you know, as the OECD has said, it's those are the, the taxes on capital and labour are the most damaging to growth. So if we can find a way of shifting the taxation um, burden towards, towards bounce, towards environmental taxes, then, then that potentially can be, can be good for, can be good for growth. Um, but what I would say, you know, we, we've known this for 100 years, really, and you mentioned that you mentioned Arthur Pigou there, um, you know, with his theories 100 years ago. But as you know, but 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 as you also pointed out, we've still got very very low levels of, of, of environmental taxes, um, both in the EU, um, but but across the whole whole OECD as well. Um, so I think that, you know, I think there's two reasons behind that. I mean, one reason is if if you look at certainly if you look at energy emissions. For example, certainly from businesses, but for most businesses, they're only around three uh, percent of, of the production costs. So, so we probably shouldn't overemphasise the potential um, for those environmental taxes. But, but clearly, I think it, potentially they could be higher than they are. So, so, so I think the key the key issue is clearly one of um, one of politics and how we build, if you like, those those political coalitions um, so that there is consensus around shifting um, to environmental taxes. And what I would say from, in terms of the business community, um, I think there are two key concerns that we have. Um, I think the first key concern um, is, really around, is really around the losers, um, and particularly in this case, it would be the environmentally, um, sorry, the, the, the energy intensive industries. Um, and so there's a particular concern that those, particularly in a global trading environment, I think there's a, there's a particular concern that they would be, their competitiveness would be, would be hit disproportionately. Um, and particularly if we work in, a, in an environment, for example, where we don't have the carbon border adjustment mechanism, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say that necessarily say our position on that, but, but at the moment, one can clearly see a situation where, where, you, where, you, where you heavily tax EU environmentally intensive, uh, energy intensive industries, and they lose competitiveness, and we simply import from outside the EU, and that's really doing nobody any good. It's certainly not 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 reducing global emissions. Um, so there's an issue there, I think, particularly around energy intensive industries. But there's a broader issue, um, I think, around compensating the losers in, in 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 an overall package. So you mentioned the energy tax directive, for example. I'm, unfortunately, I've been around long enough that I can remember the uh, the, the, the 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 kind of the, the launch to try and revise the energy tax directive under the under the Danish presidency around 10 years ago. I wasn't there 10 years before that when they did revise it, fortunately, but I do remember sort of 10 years ago. And it essentially becomes a battle between um, diesel producing um, countries that produce diesel cars and countries that, that, that produce petrol cars. And, and so, you know, you have to find a, a way of, of compensating and finding a way through that package. So that's, that's, that's the first point around, around the losers there. I think the, the other issue, which surprised me a little bit coming from the UK, as I say, for reasons I'll explain, I mean, obviously, when, when we talk about the benefits of increasing environmental taxes, certainly for business, it's the idea that we can reduce other taxes as a part of an overall package. And as I say, coming from the UK, we, have, we normally have, for better or worse, we, we, we normally have strong governments, a sort of elected dictatorship sometimes described, who can, who can put through a tax package like that. And so it's not really a concern if the government says we'll, 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 we'll increase taxes there, but we'll reduce them there. That's not normally a concern, but, but I think it is um, in many European countries which have coalition governments. And there's a real concern, I think, that, that they'll simply see an increase in environmental taxes in one area 
um, with no reductions uh, in, in another. So, so as I say, the, I think the key is really around building those, building those, building those coalitions, those packages that compensate losers that, that, that think through how we can do this in, in a careful way. As I say, in particular, that doesn't that doesn't that doesn't reduce competitive markets. Um, I'll pick on, on on one further little point um, before before I before I let other people speak. Um, and that's obviously we need to remember the other principles of taxation. In particular, I think the issues around parity and simplification. So, for example, some people have thought about using the VAT system a little bit more um, uh, to, 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 to maybe to maybe to, to maybe reduce taxation on on green goods. But that does, I think, lead to further complications. Thinking about exactly what is a green good and what you know, as we see with the taxonomy a little bit. And what's a green good and how does that change as the years go by? Um, but I think there is scope there. I mean, for example, I think we have different taxation within the EU, different VAT taxation, um, for example, of charging electric cars. I think some member states see it as a production, some see it as a service. So, th so there's scope there, but we have to bear in mind those key principles of taxation around clarity and certainty. Um, but, but as I say, I'll leave it there for now and uh, I look forward to the questions. Thank you very much, uh, uh, James, and, and yeah, I'm sure we will come back to those those issues about compensation, about also uh, uh, distortions uh, that currently exist uh, when there are environmental taxes between uh, different types of, of fuels, but also, you know, can we look at environmental taxation without looking, as you say, at the other uh, the other sources of taxation as part of a balanced package? and the continuing need for uh, clarity and simplification of the VAT. Well, as you know, I, I, I direct a small organization, so yes, I, I could really vote for more clarity and simplification of the VAT. I'm with you on that. Uh, now turning to um, Luca Chancel. So Luca, um, obviously you're very well known for your work on, on inequality. And one of the things that keeps holding progress back in terms of uh, green taxes is that they have a reputation for being uh, regressive. And indeed, uh, depending on their design, uh, they are purported to have a disproportionate effect on the cost of living for lower income households. At the same time, we know that poorer households are more affected, they're more exposed to pollution than other households. They're also uh, uh, less equipped to deal with the impact of pollution. For instance, in IEP, we do research of the lack of access of poorer households to green spaces. Um, and, you know, it's also very unjust because these are the households that are the least contributing to the pollution. So what can we do in your view to make sure that when we introduce those green taxes that are very much needed, we finally get a socially fair outcome? Thank you very much, Céline, for uh, the introduction, the invitation, and, and, and this question. So I, I'll turn to, to, your, to your question in, in just a minute, but first, I, I think it, it's important in this debate about taxes to, to say just a, a few general words about taxes and why taxes are important. Uh, you know, there's this saying which, which, which goes like this, taxes are the price to pay for civilization. And so, you know, why is Europe you know, one of the, the, the countries on earth where quality of life is the highest. Well, it's because it has the highest tax rate as a share of its GDP, because these taxes are financing a super good level of public infrastructures, which makes business possible, which makes it possible for citizens, which, which make, makes it possible for, for individuals to flourish and to have a good quality of life. So this is what taxes are for. And so when I hear that, you know, there's this huge big consensus that we should decrease taxes on labor and to, in order to increase taxes on environment, I just would like to remind that the era of high growth, the golden age of growth in Europe from the 1950s to the, the, the late 1970s is the era when taxes on labor were increased by the highest margins. So when we increase taxes on labor a lot, we did this to finance social security. We did this to finance a lot of things which makes it possible for business to flourish. So we should not oppose the two. That was the introductory point. Now, when it comes to environmental taxes, 
there is a large scope for increasing them. And I think the, the great study that was, that was presented makes this case pretty clearly. But I think it's also important when we say that there is no opposition or no automatic opposition between environmental taxes and social justice, because yes, this is one, this is one constraining factor. And we know from a lot of uh, examples in uh, recent political history, political debates that there, there can be a clash. And I'll talk about the French example in a minute. But what we know also is that there have been many successful cases of the introduction of environmental taxes that were not bad for the working class or for the middle class. And how did this work? So my answer to that is that we need to, to factor in the overall design of taxation. So environmental taxation cannot be understood alone in isolation from other types of taxes. And even further than that, the broader design of public investments. For instance, Sweden established its carbon tax uh, from the early 1990s onwards. But the Swedes, and so now the carbon tax in Sweden is, uh, the, has the highest nominal rates in, rate in the world. And the Swedes do not wake up in the morning saying, wow, the tax rate is too high, and so uh, uh, I, we should scrap the carbon tax. So why is that? Well, partly because one, it was introduced in the wider tax uh, reform. And second, and I think this is also extremely important and critical, huge investments were made prior to the implementation of the carbon tax from the late 1970s onwards into creating alternatives for consumers, for citizens, for energy users. And in particular, this is the develop development of local level uh, um, heating, urban heating networks. So when the carbon tax kicks in, users have an alternative. And if you introduce a carbon tax in a context of inequality, potentially also tax inequality beyond the environmental tax and without alternatives, then you have a backlash. And this is exactly what happened in the French case in 2019, where you have the introduction of a carbon tax you don't have alternatives in terms of transport modes or in terms of heating modes for a large part of the population that's at the bottom of the income scale. And at the same time, you're doing this tax reform in a broader context of an overhaul of the capital taxation. And so you're reducing tax rates on the very rich, those who have means to basically do investments and to adapt themselves to the new energy transition regime. And you're increasing the taxes on those who don't have these means, who don't have these uh, uh, possibilities. And so this creates the Yellow Vest movement. And it's not so surprising. And the good thing is that we know that we can do otherwise. And just using here another example, which is ex extremely interesting, British Columbia, Canada. So that's a, you know, a, a, a state in Canada that uh, relies a lot on oil, that relies a lot on gas. And well, the carbon tax was introduced now almost 15 years ago. It's been increasing over time. It's a success. And why is that? Because a lot of the revenues from the tax are re-injected in uh, uh, supporting low-income households. And so I think this is also connecting the point I'm making here to the earlier point. It is critical that a big part of the revenues of these carbon taxes are re-injected to support those who have little opportunities, little resources to make the transitions themselves. And so if we use these revenues for other things, for instance, reducing taxes uh, uh, elsewhere in the economy, well, we, we won't be able to use the same euro twice. So we need to make these choices. And if we want to buy political support for these taxes, we need to inject a lot of money to compensating the losers. Final point, there are sectors that remain untaxed in Europe. I think that the uh, IEP study uh, really discusses this, and this is extremely important. I just would like to mention two. One is kerosene taxation, so internal flights. You know, we're in 2021, and it's completely absurd that this is still untaxed after all these years. And so the few countries that want to do that should move ahead. Otherwise, we'll still be waiting for 10 years to have a, a pan-European agreement on this. And then final point, 
because we talk less about that. But capital is generally untaxed in Europe when we compare it to labor. But we also are not talking enough about uh, the options of taxes, taxing capital in proportion as a function of the carbon that is associated to it, as a proportion of the carbon that is included, embedded in the investments we make. And here, the good thing is that there are many alternatives. You know, if you own money, if you want to invest, you can make a lot of different investment choices in more carbonated sectors and in much less carbonated sectors. And so far, there is no direct tax system that makes it possible to influence these choices. And I think this really is a key area for the coming years. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, lots of uh, food for thought in, in what you said. Particularly happy that you mentioned uh, the, the, what we can do in terms of assets and directing savings um, uh, towards, uh, you know, um, products uh, that based on the taxonomy are greener and then the average, and out of the crisis, there are actually trillions in bank deposits. And there's a real big question as to how the state could direct those, uh, those deposits uh, by using tax, either tax breaks or uh, uh, obviously taxing uh, those assets that are, have more embedded carbon uh, within them. Um, any reactions from you, uh, James, on, on, on what you heard? I think there were some, some points that were in, in, in common, but also I think from you more of a worry that out of this crisis we'll have uh, uh, every type of taxation uh, increasing. So do you want to, any, any points you would like to add uh, within uh, uh, following what, uh, what uh, Lucas said? Um. Well, I think I think there is a lot of, lot of points we, we we would agree with there. I mean, I think I think I think the, the, just on the on, on on your opening point, Lucas. I mean, certainly certainly, uh, I read that quote in the FT as well yesterday. I think that the taxes are the price we pay for for, for civilization. Um, I think that's certainly the case. I, I'd be careful of drawing a, a a linear relationship between sort of more taxes and more civilization. Really, I think we have lower levels of taxation in, in the US. Um, and in Japan, I think, and, and their, their civilized economies, um, you know, so, 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 so it's certainly not the case that the more you tax, the more civilization you get. And of course, the danger, I think, is if you increase taxes too much, that, that reduces work incentives. Um, and, 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 you know, that's, that, that's not going to help the delivery of the economy, delivery of public services, etc. Um, I think the other, the other point, I, I'm not sure I'd entirely agree with, or not, not sure, not so always entirely clear this business that we we we, we don't tax um capital very much um in in europe i mean i think two points to make there obviously taxation is a member state competence so um if member states want to cap tax capital more relative to labor obviously that that, that that's that's their competence and that's that's why as Celine mentioned at the start the, the country specific recommendations they they have recommendations on tax but it's the member states and it's their competence um, but let's not forget as well that when we talk about corporate tax, uh, corporate taxation, that's really a backstop to the, 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 the income tax um, system as well. So in, in most countries, if you receive share income, you would be taxed um, through, the, through, 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 the, through the tax system in a similar way to the, if, if you received it as, uh, as labour income. So they say that that capital taxation, the, the corporate tax is a backstop. So, so I think we just have to be a little bit careful there. But as I say, I think we lot, lot of could agree with you. Uh, Luca, I, I wanted also to come back on what you said on uh, what would be the best ways to uh, make sure that we have a socially fair outcome and get you to uh, talk about this issue of labour taxation. Because arguably, one could reduce taxation on uh, low salaries, or one could choose to do direct redistribution, which is, you know, called uh, either carbon dividends or pollution dividends. Some are even talking about a universal basic income. Or as you say, one could put more money in social or infrastructure investments. In your view, I mean, what's, what's, what's the magical mix between those three approaches? I think that the point I'm, I'm making here is that uh, it, yeah, it, it, it really all boils down to who actually is going to benefit from these sets of policies. And you can, of course, 
a reduced labor taxation in a way that's pretty progressive. But by the way, in a country like France, for instance, and in some other European countries, labor taxes uh, around minimum wage have been reduced by a lot over the past years, and there, there is a very, very little taxes left to be reduced. And unfortunately, this didn't really have a huge impact in terms of you know, reducing the, 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 the high unemployment rate in this country. And this was the, the, the objective that was, that, that, was, uh, proposed, that, that was presented. But, but still, if you want to do a progressive tax, so that's one option. I think you know, direct transfers is also an option. And I think that investing in public service infrastructures alternative is a really important one in the sense that you are going to ensure uh, a free access to these services. What I'm saying is that we cannot use one euro twice. And so we really need to make these, the, these choices and, and, and to discuss them very explicitly and, 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 and practically. And just saying that reducing taxes of labor is, is going to be good, as some economists have done also over the past 20 years in, in the models that we do is not really helping the, the debate. So I'm really uh, glad that we're having this debate today about really what exactly this means in practice. Thanks. We have lots of questions coming from our audience. So let me start with, with one which uh, goes to what you were uh, saying, uh, James, about the role of the EU. Um, because at the end of the day, uh, it is the member states uh, that are the masters of their own taxation system, with some exceptions, and I mentioned those files that are discussed at the EU level. And we still have the issue of the unanimity. So I'll start with James. I mean, where do you think the EU can play a role in introducing environmental taxes? And if you could also elaborate in the context, we'll see, I mean, there are now discussions about uh, uh, reintroducing the Growth and Stability Pact in 2023 will have uh, uh, skyrocketing uh, public deficits. So as you said, we will need to find money somewhere. So could you speak about the role of the EU and the added value on environmental taxes specifically, but also more largely in terms of generating, mobilizes the res mobilizing the resources that we will need uh, as we uh, let's hope so, have a V-shaped uh, recovery out of the COVID crisis. James? I think you are... Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, look, I mean, I think, I think, I think, I mean, I think one of the key issues as somebody, I think it was mentioned in the chat there, obviously it requires unanimity at, at the EU level. I'm not sure if it was this commission, or I think it was even the previous commission that said there's something like they were going to be big on the big things and small on the small things. Um, and for, I mean, if you think about it, if you think about it, at least theoretically, the EU should really be focusing on the environmental taxes where there is a real spillover externality right across the EU. Um, so obviously, you know, carbon tax, that's even a global, that's even a global issue, emission issue. But if we think about, you know, air emissions that, 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 that you know, maybe start off in Germany and, and then get, get sent over onto Sweden and Finland, that, that's clearly the external analysis and we and it's clearly an issue that, that needs to be dealt with at EU level. Um, I started my career looking at waste recycling. It wasn't so obvious to be honest, as I say, and this is 20 years ago, some of the directives regarding recycling, why that was really necessarily um, an EU-wide issue and, and what, what externality we're exactly trying to tackle there. So as I say, use that capital, political capital wisely, um, focus only on the things where you really need to act at EU level, um, and not, not not the things that maybe can be dealt with de dealt with elsewhere. Um, and then and then you know fall back on some of the principles we talked talked about building those building those coalitions. And and as Lucas said, thinking about thinking about how we can how, how we can make sure um, you know that the, the, the inequality impacts are not, not not so damaging. And I'll just add one point on that. You know if we're gonna if we're going to reduce labour taxes, then let, let's let's focus it on the, on the lower income groups. Maybe raising personal allowances. Um, you know, if, if, if that if that's what's required. Thank you, uh, thank you, James. Uh, same question now to Luca. Yeah, you know, I I think that the the general logic that the EU has been following for the past twenty years um, is a good logic from the point of view of 
you know, a wide EU integration. Now, we've seen that in terms of effectively moving forward. It's not a particularly winning strategy. And so I think that more and more we need uh, coalitions of the willing. So groups of countries willing to move forwards faster than the others, because for instance, in terms of taxation and in terms of corporate taxation that we've been mentioning over the past few minutes. Well, if we wait for, you know, Irish support to the introduction of a minimum corporate income tax or uh, support from the Netherlands, for, for instance, countries that would, you know, lose a lot from the introduction of such reforms, even though Europe as a whole would gain a lot. Well, we're not going to be able to move forward. So we really need coalitions of the willing. So this is possible under EU law. So enhanced cooperation. But I also think that in several cases, we can also decide to move a few countries, even if the enhanced cooperation framework is not working. So you can decide to establish a, you know, multilateral uh, tax treaty between three EU member states on the introduction, for instance, of a new environmental tax reform. Now, what, what matters and what is important is that these countries can also do this in a way that doesn't affect their own industries, their own businesses. Otherwise, the price to pay is going to be big and there will be a backlash, either a social or business backlash. But I think that moving forward, that testing, that implementing these options with groups of countries that are willing to move forward really is the strategy to follow now, rather than having to wait for an agreement of 27 member states that, are, that can be pretty different in their objectives. Thanks. So enhanced cooperation and also, uh, you know, new multilateral, uh, sorry, plurilateral uh, uh, instruments there. Um, very interesting. Um, another question uh, that, that uh, people are asking is really how do you frame the narrative? Um, because even if you have a way to redistribute uh, to low income groups, they might think that on one hand you give them something and on the other you take the other one and they might just look at the price of petrol, so the price of essential goods, and not be terribly convinced about the other mechanisms. So, you know, or, or, or is it about increasing salaries? I mean, what, what sort of narrative? Because I'm putting myself in the shoes of, of a finance minister in a member state. You clearly don't want to have, as you say, uh, uh, Lucas Chancel, a big political problem on your hand. So what would be your views as to how we need to frame this narrative to convince those that would be affected that they won't be uh, left uh, behind? And I'll start with, with Lucas and then I'll go to, to Tim. You know, I think, you know, the overall narrative is climate change and is, uh, you know, the future generations are going to suffer a lot if we don't act a little today. But then the other narrative is the wallet. You know, the, the gains needs to be higher than the losses. And if the compensation mechanisms are designed in a way that people are going to see that they're gaining more, that they have a direct transfer on their bank account at the end of every month or every semester, as it is the case in British Columbia, then you are buying the support of your population that could potentially be against that without this transfer. So it's really, narrative is important, but the big narrative, we have it, it's climate change and the need to act against it. But then the concrete thing that is buying the support of people is whether or not at the end of the month, they see that there's a difference in their own uh, uh, living standard. And I think British Columbia is a good example of this and how this can work uh, um, concretely. Thanks. So now turning to you, James, and possibly asking you to also think about, you know, uh, SMEs. I mean, how would you sell those environmental taxes to small and medium enterprises? Yeah, I mean, if we, if, if we come back to the big picture, and I'm not really qualified on this, but I would focus on two things. First of all, I think, I think we need to be honest about this. Um, and that, you know, shifting, shifting to a, a lower carbon future is, is going gonna, is gonna to cost us and it's going to cost the consumer. Um, quite frankly, if businesses were, 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 businesses were, were 
if it was cheaper for businesses to do things in these more environment friendly ways, they would be doing it already. So there is going to be a shift towards towards this new no carbon future. Um, and we should be honest with this. We should be politicians should be should be clear to the electorate. Um, because I think the you know I think most people are, are aware that that you know that that they. The, the, the overall case is there. We, we do need to, we do need to, to, to shift um, to, to a more sustainable future, but we should be honest that it's really costly. And then I think linked to that, I think we should steer away um, from anything that, that, that sniffs of tokenism, because I think people are, people are too smart to see through that. Um, so anything that, you know, that, 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 that people can see is not going to have a, have a, have a, real, inco a real impact on achieving that goal that we all want to achieve around a more sustainable um, climate. I mean, any measures that are costly or, or, or you're putting in place that just because they're popular, but really aren't gonna, aren't gonna have, a, a, have a real real benefit. I think we need to we need to be very careful of those. And of course that, you know, that, that brings us back to the whole climate change issue and the real need um, to be doing everything to be achieving to achieving things at a global level because ultimately people look and they know they know that the EU's Carbon emissions are very small proportion um, of global ones. Um, so, so that 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 issue around tokenism um, or, or not delivering real results, I think it, it is a real one that we need to we, we need to address. Thanks. We have more questions that are getting more into the nitty gritty of uh, taxes. Uh, one is an issue that we have not mentioned yet: is about should we not start by stopping subsidies? So that's one. Uh, another one is around: should we not move away from taxes on productive, uh, from productive activities such as the VAT, to move to taxes that are mostly focused on externalities, so carbon tax, land location value tax, uh, which uh, the the person from the audience I don't have your name is saying it might be more might be both pro business and pro uh, environment. Um, who wants to start on those on those uh, two questions? Luca? Yeah, thanks a lot. So uh, absolutely, you know, subsidies, environmentally harmful subsidies need to stop. Um, and um, it's it's related, not exactly the same category of uh, in, in in the tax system, but uh, there there are also a lot of tax loopholes. So basically one type of environmentally harmful product or for one type of user of this product is completely untaxed versus another user. I'm thinking in, for instance, of kerosene. And so this is an indirect subsidy and this really needs to stop. It's not the introduction of a new tax, it's just treating all consumers equally. And it's not making a, 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 a you know, situation that are highly beneficial for some types of consumers versus the others. Take the, for instance, the situation of a, a, a European, you know, or French man, for instance, going to work, uh, taking uh, his or her car, French man or French woman taking his or her car being taxed in France, but the person that is going to ch take a private jet for the weekend or to take uh, uh, um, uh, an official airline to go to, uh, to, to, uh, to a Saturday retreat will not pay taxes on this same kerosene, on the same, almost the same molecule. So this is an indirect subsidy or hidden subsidy and this needs to stop. That's the first point. The second point on you know, shifting production taxes, shifting from, you know, VAT to, uh, to more environmental taxes. A part of this, I think, is interesting. At the same time, what is very important in the tax system and in the European tax system is the progressivity of this tax system. And so far, when it comes to environmental taxes, we cannot, we, we have not yet design progressive environmental taxes. This could be done. For instance, we could be taxed more if we earn more, you know, tax more on the carbon we consume if we're richer. The, the rate of taxation on carbon could, could be differentiated on the basis of our wealth or of the level of carbon that we consume. This is an option, but, but this is not yet on the table. What I'm saying is that for the moment, when we introduce environmental taxes, well, we see that it's important to fix the inequality that it might generate through other taxes. So that's why we really need this overall 
tax system to keep this progressivity and we cannot shift everything to the environmental taxes. Uh, thanks, Luca. Uh, James, what's your view? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's firstly, a, I think it's a good point that's raised around looking at the entire interventions um, of governments and obviously one has to look at, at nationally and, and, and at EU level. And, and, and the various ways that they're intervening and, and you know, is, is the left hand coordinated with the right hand in one sense. And, and I think in a sense we are increasingly doing this and I'll give one example, I think the EIB now for example is looking at some of the interventions they make in terms of lending and, and restricting that I think within the energy sector so they're not lending to certain energy sectors. Now whether you agree or disagree with that it seems at least it's more, it's more, more coordinated um, that way. I'd say the same provisos that I mentioned earlier need, 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 to, need to carry on. We need to think about, you know, long-term adjustments so that we don't we suddenly lose those competitors, those industries. But that, that seems sensible. And I think, you know, you know, particularly, you know, when we're looking at we think about R&D, we look, we look at some of the investments on the production side, we need, we need to think about that, that whole cycle. So I think that's sensible. Um, on VAT, I mean, I think I'm, I made some points earlier. I mean, I think there is probably some scope um, to, 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 to shifting towards VAT and away from less damaging taxes. But as I say, I think we need to bear in mind those, those points I made um, around the efficiency um, and, and the, 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 the clarity uh, of, of the tax system as well, if, if we move down that route. But it's certain, certainly possibilities there. Thanks. Uh, one question coming uh, from the audience is around the circular economy. Because obviously we talk a lot about the carbon budgets um, and pollutions that are linked with uh, the use of uh, oil and gas, uh, but there are many other uh, sources of pollutions and there's also a big issue in terms of the material budget. Uh, we are uh, consuming too many materials. I mean, if everyone consumed like Europeans, you would need three planets worth uh, of resources. So what role do you see uh, for environmental taxation to help drive the circular economy and to help uh, new sectors, uh, you know, flourish. Uh, the, the person from the audience is talking about uh, plastic recyclers, uh, but we could also see at other ways where you're actually preventing uh, waste. So that might be tax breaks if you're preventing waste uh, uh, rather than creating waste that needs to be recycled. So I'll start probably uh, with, with James and then I'll ask Luca. Okay. Right, now, now, I'm, re now I'm really good. I mean, I've been talking about areas I don't know. I, I'm not really supposed to talk about. Now I'm really off piece. So these, these are personal thoughts. Well, on the, on, the, on the recycling, and as I say, I started my career on this 20 years ago. I do think we need to think carefully about the exact externality that we're trying to address here. Um, so, I mean, you talked about a materials budget. Well, I, re I remember when I was growing up as a kid being told that basically we'd run out of oil and we'd run out of gas in 30 years time. Look, here we are, we've found more oil and gas. And, and you know, when, when, we, when we talk about materials, as they start to run out, as the price goes up, that will clearly drive innovation. It will drive companies to develop alternative materials, new materials and such like. Um, so I, I do, you know, I, th I think, you know, plastics, it seems to me that clearly is an issue around around the disposal of plastics, um, but 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 is there really so much of an externality as long as we're pricing it in the extraction? If the extraction is taking place overseas, you know, in some sense, it does seem to me that the market is is going to address um, those the, the, those shortages of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of those of those goods if if if, the, if if we've got the extraction price right, let's say, um, and of course, you know. Again, you know, recycling it's it's third down that hierarchy of of, of way, uh, the hierarchy of waste, isn't it? It's, so so again, targeting your, your third best outcome sometimes you know seems to me a little bit a little bit dangerous. You know, obviously to, to, top is top is reduced, second is reuse, and third is recycling. So that that can and certainly when I was working on it, certainly certainly brought some 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 perversity centers a little bit. But as I say. Think carefully about the exact externality that you are trying to address and try and address it that directly with the right system. Let me probably register my disagreement on what you're saying, but you know, I'm the chair, I'm the moderator, so I should not intervene too much. 
Luca, your turn. Right. So the the entire point of environmental taxation, uh, whether it's on energy, whether it's on uh, other types of pollutants, is to as 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 uh, as James was saying, reduce, reuse, but also recycle. And I. I I wouldn't really uh, 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 define a, a, a classification by order of importance in these three sets of very important dimensions of the transition. Where I was a bit surprised and perhaps a little disappointed, to be honest, is is when I heard uh, when I heard in the discussion that you know businesses in Europe would necessarily face a higher cost in the face of the transition. And I think that this is, you know, a, 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 a very sectoral way to approach the whole, the whole picture and the whole transition that's ahead of us. Obviously, some businesses will face higher costs because their model is not fit for the transition. Others can adapt and others, again, are, are going to be extremely well fit for this transition. And so in many ways, more recycling, more reusing is going to be a cost cutter, is going to be a great source of efficiency gains for European businesses. And I think that, you know, this is really where we should invest in. And so this is going to turn what some might see as a necessary cost in certain sectors as actually transition that is um, generating productivity gains in many others. And these are the sectors that we would like to see flourish in Europe. So this includes indeed uh, uh, the, the, the circular economy, uh, uh, all the circular economy businesses. And many sectors can turn to the circular economy even if they're not there yet. Thanks. Um, as we're moving, uh... Uh, shortly to the to the end of the meeting, I wanted to give uh, both of you the opportunity to say any final remarks, anything that surprised you that you learned or that was confirmed in in this conversation. As we're moving towards finding a pathway to uh, you know to address this issue we have about the lack of internalization of pollution costs. Uh, let me start with uh, Luca. Perhaps just uh, j just just repeat the general messages that was uh, I was trying to put forward today. I think when it comes to environmental taxation, what really matters is the general tax system policy design. And so, an environmental tax alone, uh, without other changes changes in the tax system, especially changes that will secure more progressivity, more tax justice, are very likely to fail. First point. Second point, investment. We need to invest ahead in alternatives. If there are no in, um, um, investments, if there are no alternatives possible, when consumers have to face the tax, then we're just really uh, using a hammer and hammering a part of the population. And this is, again, not going to work. And the third point is our relationship with how we deal with European consensus or lack of consensus. And I really think that, you know, we need to move towards the era of coalitions of the willing. And this is extremely important for big countries, say like Germany, like France, like Italy, like Spain, that have a lot to gain from implementing things that some other countries, perhaps smaller countries, uh, would lose from uh, the implementation of such, such taxes. And you know, down the line, Europe as a whole will gain from that, but a few key countries willing to do these, you know, pioneering sort of progresses should move forward faster than the others. Thank you. And now the last word to James. Okay. Well, no, I mean, I think it's often said, but uh, let me repeat it, you know, business, business can and should be part of the solution here. Um, and, and not seen as a problem, not seen just as a problem at least. You know, if we think about the incredible advances that are being made in technology, you look at aircraft emissions, aircraft engines, and, and the way they've become more efficient through the development of technology um, in, in recent years. So, so, so yeah, there's a business clearly as, as part of the solution. Um, and I would be careful, that, that last point Lucas made not in, in the previous intervention, um, around, around to repeat my, my, my point uh, around it uh, around this 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 being 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 costly. Look, you know there, there will be there will be businesses 
in specific industries who would like to see more, more regulation, no doubt they've got a competitive advantage in some areas. But I really do think we should be careful about telling business that this that that, that somehow this is this is this is going to be in their, in their in their interest. There's a danger there's a danger sometimes that we we, we, you know, we should be listening to business. And if business is saying that you know, this transition is going to be more costly, I think we need to listen to that and not tell them that actually you can do it more cheaply um, than, than you think you can or you can do it that way more cheaply. You know, businesses know their business better than officials will. will. Um, so so, so we, we, should, we, we should be listening li listen to them and, and, and business uh, can be a strong partner. Thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, I really want to thank both of our uh, speakers for their excellent uh, remarks. I certainly uh, enjoyed uh, the, the, the discussion. I also want to thank the audience for their insightful questions and, and DJ Environment who put uh, this event uh, together. Um, short concluding remarks uh, from, from me. Uh, it is clear that as part of the recovery out of the crisis, with a high public deficits, lots of discussions about where we will go in terms of our macroeconomic policy and the urgency of climate change, but also the biodiversity crisis, we have a need for a new economic, social and ecological contract within Europe, which ultimately will allow us to uh, you know, uh, keep away from uh, disastrous uh, climate instability and strengthen our resilience to multiple shocks. I think everyone in uh, this uh, meeting is attached to civilization and to the quality of the social services we can provide, the fact that in Europe, we do not think that people should remain in poverty or should be materially deprived, which means that we need to have a grand tax uh, bargain. So that was another consensus uh, within this discussion that you need to look at environmental taxes and environmental taxes are an important instrument, but you can't look at them in abstract from the rest of the tax system. And we also talked about the fact that you can't look at it without looking at the expenditure side. What will you do with the revenues, social, public investments, infrastructure investments, also, you know, how do we direct private investments towards what has the highest value for society? Direct transfers were uh, mentioned, also uh, labor uh, tax uh, with a particular focus on low income uh, households. We also uh, had a consensus about the narrative, that the narrative needs to be truthful, it needs to be credible in terms of the environmental uh, uh, impact, so no tokenistic uh, approach, and it needs to be fair. People need to know that there's fairness, fairness between people, fairness between uh, sectors, fairness between uh, different countries of the EU. We also saw a consensus about the fact that we need to be politically astute, whether it's by being flexible with a coalition of the willing or uh, um, by um, by starting with, with some uh, countries, very few set of countries that would take uh, action, sometimes unilaterally on uh, kerosene tax, but also the fact that we need a grand coalition uh, and therefore a balanced outcome where the different forces at play, whether it's the household or business and the different sectors, feel there's something in it for them. So we pass through all the different hurdles that we have, either at the national level or at the European level. Um, so I think, and then we also talked about the fact that uh, we need to think about the future and future proofing uh, our tax system so they can withstand the passing of time and all the changes, whether they're demographic or technological, that we will uh, see in our uh, lifetime. So I think with this, uh, I would encourage everyone to uh, watch the space uh, because many discussions are coming ahead with the resilience and recovery plans the Energy Tax um, uh, Directive, CBAM, uh, the implementation of the Zero Pollution Action Plan, and, and we hope more and more uh, initiatives from member states to look at environmental taxes, corporate taxation, digital taxation, uh, you name it. So uh, keep watching the space, and let's hope that we can all work together to get that grand bargain so we can really live well 
within planetary boundaries in Europe and elsewhere. I thank you very much. Thank you.